All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. And um, we're just going to do the intros while you're all uh, logging in. And um, I just want to say it's been a month or two since we did the last one. It's a great follow up. Um, if you missed the last one, you can look for that on well, all the normal channels on my website, on podcasts, search for it on LinkedIn. And if you really can't find it, I'll email it to you. That was all about Moira app. And there is a direct linkage to this, which I'm going to try to bring in, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's just pause and hand over to Marius to do the intro. Marius. Mm. Uh, hello, Colin and, and everyone joining. It's a real privilege to have all of you on, uh, on our, Colin. This is our fifth um, Game Changers um, thing. I think. Yeah, so welcome to all of you from wh wherever you are. Um, just a little bit about the purpose of these sessions. It's really a contribution from Cybran. It's, you know, we're not here to, to sell anything. It's just a contribution to, to share knowledge and, um, you know, to develop skills um, and knowledge around the new things that's happening um, in our world in the technology space. Um, with us is Colin Isles. So Colin uh, is uh, the owner of a company called Innovation Catalysts. He's been supporting our Game Changer initiative since the since we initiated this about six months ago. Um, and we've had some great conversations. So, you know, if you in, enjoy today's with Jan, you know, please make sure that you come back for, for some of the other ones to follow. Um, and... Um, yeah, and, in, and also if you if if you like what we're doing and you want to use this platform to share some of your knowledge, you know, please contact um, Colin, um, you know, and see if you could find the slot to to share some of your knowledge with with the audiences that we get. So Colin himself, so you know what he's uh, about is to to work with leadership to create innovation at scale. Um, and help all of us to change the way we think about the future. Um, you know, some of his clients uh, include uh, Google, AWS. He does a lot of work with Huawei, Standard Bank, uh, Northside Capital, and us, um, Cybran, um, and the Crossfin Group. So, Colin, thanks um, again <clears throat> for, for supporting this initiative. And then I want to introduce to you Jan Polbauer. Jan is the uh, CEO of Banks of Africa. Um, he tells me that um, <clears throat> he's actually born in Czechoslovakia. Uh, he's been living in Canada for a number of years where he, was, he spent a lot of his time with, with Payments Canada. Um, and Jan, I think uh, something that I really resonate with in terms of uh, your profile is the fact that you're quite passionate about um, digital transformation. And I, and I think specifically um, financial inclusion, which, which is a critical thing um, in our continent and uh, many of other developing worlds, you know. So, you know, we always say fun, uh, financial inclusion is, is, of course, not only about payments um, that we that we are both in, involved in, but many other things like, you know, the right to an education, you know, the right do many other things as, as, as part of the financial inclusion. So Jan, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you having us um, today for the next hour. And for everyone, you know, feel free to ask or post questions and you know, we'll try to I, I try our best to, to answer them. So, okay, thanks, Colin, um, over to you. Marius, uh, thank you very much for the intro. And again, warm welcome to everyone that's just joined. Please do ask questions as we're going through. You can do that by putting it as a post on the chat. We'll try to get to those. Um, it, if you really want it to stand out, then do it as uh, the Q&A. And, &A. and um, then it pops up and I can't miss it. I have to actually get through to it. And I will try to make sure we answer as many as possible. Um, where should we start? Well, let's, I suppose, start with an intro, shall we, Jan? And I, I want to set this up and just say, um, in 2019, you've joined BankServ in a role which I found quite interesting, Chief Payments and Innovation Officer. I kind of look at infrastructure providers and when they say they've got innovation officers, I sort of take a stand back and go, that doesn't normally happen. But you've come from abroad, you've started off in the Czech Republic, you've worked in lovely places, uh, both there and then across into Canada, and you've taken this decision to come to South Africa in 2019. Could you tell me why and, and use that to sort of you know frame the role that you've got now as CEO? Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Now, of course, the bar is high because you all talked about the 
personnel how great the webinars uh, were and now you are stuck with me so uh, i'll try my best but uh, very nice to be here thank you for the invitation um so listen yes they made me a chief payments and innovation officer and uh, maybe they were also worried so at the end i ended up being the ceo but uh, why africa why south africa as I mentioned, you know, I am really passionate about making a difference. I, I love working for an organization which uh, doesn't only focus on, uh, you know, creating shareholder value, but also uh, making a difference. And South Africa, not that long ago, you were very, very advanced with payments. Many uh, payments world firsts actually happened here. And I think the Western world, sometimes, uh, you know, they kind of have an idea of Africa and they think about Mpesa and Kenya. But there are so there is so much more to Africa, and uh, I kind of felt, you know what? Uh, hopefully, I can help a little bit with my with my piece, and we can show the world how payments uh, and financial inclusion is actually supposed to be done. So that's that's what motivated me, and a bit of an adventure for the family as well, coming from boring Canada, where my boys were. Okay, well, on behalf of everyone, welcome. You're still here. You've been here for a couple of years, so you're obviously enjoying it. Um, what I want to get through today is uh, a bit about BankServe and your role, um, dig into the rapid payments program, which is ongoing and meant to be being released in part this year, I believe, and find out if this is indeed going to happen. Or maybe I missed it and it just wasn't advertised. Um, your vision for 25 and beyond to see how far this can go. Obstacles to change. There must be lots in the uh, South African context. In fact, any country is going to struggle with the ambition that we've talked about before this call. Um, and then also I want to really dig into some of the threats and the opportunities of blockchain as we're going through this. Hopefully some of the people on the call are going to be thinking, hold on a minute, but we can do this with DeFi already. Why do we need these central authorities to go and organize this you know for us it's already out there um, in a very different um, ecosystem and if we've got more time we can go into other stuff and in amongst all that trying to make sure that we get the questions from everyone on the call through to you as well so we're not going to be at all time pressured we will finish on the hour in 52 minutes mm -hmm. so let's start what is bank serve what's bank serves role <laughs> The, the, the name may give it away a little bit, but we serve more than just the banking community. We serve the payments uh, payments ecosystem. And we are kind of this invisible organization, utility, not for profit. We call ourselves mutual behind the scene. But uh, yes, the fact that you receive your salary or when you tap or you know pay with your card, uh, in most cases, we are behind that when this annoying OTP comes on a lot when you are trying to make e-commerce transactions. In many cases, it's also us. And unfortunately, also the debit orders. So uh, yes, when the money is taken away from you, that's also us behind the scenes. So if everything goes well, I don't think anybody needs to know about us. But when things don't go well, the economy feels it. I usually explain, Colin, how it would look like if we were not around. And, you know, it, uh, it would probably still work. Like, you know, in the past, um, the banks were not interconnected. They were all working themselves in a closed loop environment. So if we were not around, uh, when you want to send money to someone, you would have to ensure that they transact with the same bank. Otherwise, you couldn't send them money. When you want to withdraw money from, from an ATM, you would have to find the ATM uh, which belongs to your bank. And of course, when you pay at a merchant, the merchant would probably have 16 point of sale or how many point of sale terminals. So based on the card you brought, they, uh, they would use the right one, which talks to the right bank. And that's what we changed. So Banks of Africa is really about the interoperability and creating these bridges and connections between these closed loop environments, which, um, which exist in the payment space. So you're, you're a critical part of the infrastructure then. You're basically sitting there and bridging the transactions between the banks and Samos, the, um, uh, what would you call Samos? The, uh, the, the settlement the, system the, for the central bank. Yeah. Settlement system, you know, for, um, for the central bank. And you're a critical part of that framework in terms of the transaction messaging and making sure we've got settlements and clearing of the millions, hundreds of millions of, of transactions which are being published and processed on a daily basis is it and is it also correct that most of the transactions in terms of volume is the retail market so e-commerce you know atms so we we only serve the retail market and as you mentioned uh, we process around four billion four billion transactions a year which accounts to i think like 14 trillion in terms of value uh rent value 
Um, so uh, the retail is majority of volumes uh, when it comes to the payments ecosystem in South Africa. Of course, Samos or the high value system, the settlement system, majority of value gets kind of cleared and settled there. But the transactions are the number of transactions are relatively small. And as you said, you know, we are critical and um, it's kind of exciting to work for an environment which is mission critical because in the first few days of the month, when uh, people collect or receive their Sasa grants and stuff like that, and you see the big lineups at ATMs, which is, by the way, something we are trying to change, we process around 300 transactions per second uh, every, every, every second in the morning. So uh, when you think about it, if we go down for a couple of seconds or a minute or something, quite a few people get upset that uh, they cannot get the money or they cannot pay for the things they, they want to pay for. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So I'm assuming you've got hosted platforms just as an aside. I don't think you'll have moved to the cloud yet. Maybe we'll come back to that later. I don't know if you, if the latency there is a little bit too uh, risque, but from my experience, things seem to be uh, working quite well because when I've traveled and, and worked abroad, and obviously if you don't know, I'm, I'm from England originally comparing my experience in South Africa, it's been a net positive in many ways, especially on payments. It's relatively easy. The banks seem to get on with you and, and collaborate well together so that we can draw cash from ATMs, from other providers without having unnecessary charges in, in most cases. Um, if I want to make a payment to someone for most experiences, I can do it immediately, or at least from my perspective, it feels like it's immediate and it's going into someone's account. Um, you've already got platforms in place where we can do QR scans, you know, SnapScan and Zapper and a bunch of others that are allowing us to, to go and have this sort of easier processing at the till. There's just so many um, upsides. I think, you know, um, we can send messages to each other via telephone numbers and already go and initiate a settlement if you want to, to pay someone on the road. So, so we're not quite up to sort of, you know, what would I say, we pay in China levels. But on the other hand, we're well ahead of the United States and most parts of Europe and the, and the UK, I'd say. Is that your assessment? Oh, and I think you should join our marketing department. I, I probably cannot afford you. I'm but, waiting uh, for all the, the guys now to go complete rubbish, Colin. It's a complete disaster. <laughs> um, listen, that's, uh, that's probably one of, the, one of the issues sometimes the Western world may have, uh, that uh, people living in US, Canada, they feel that uh, you know, they have everything the best. And I experienced exactly the same thing. When I moved to Canada and I wanted to pay for my rent, they asked me to write a check. That was, let's say, 15 or 18 years ago. I didn't know how to write a check coming from Europe, right? Uh, there are many things where Canada, US are significantly behind uh, when it comes to the payment Three world. Three-day settlement in the US plus a $20, $25 charge. Yeah. Uh, so, listen... South Africa uh, is doing really well. I mentioned that there are quite a few areas where we were the first. Like when it comes to real time clearing, we were actually even before UK. So we were two years before faster payments actually came to life in um, in the UK. I think uh, when you are looking how payments should be done these days, you really look at some of the Asian countries, South Asia, even India, China, you, you mentioned it. There are, of course, some, uh, some downsides uh, and we cannot replicate uh, the experience we saw somewhere else, straight to South Africa. The only caveat, Colin, I would uh, probably put is South Africa, as you know, has two economies, right? Uh, people living uh, in uh, developed areas, you know, people around Sandton, and Cape Town, we pay very comfortably. We don't have to carry cash around. Uh, the acceptance is relatively high. But uh, based on our research, uh, this accounts only for 15% of the overall transactions. So when I talked about 4 billion uh, payments which are happening you know, through our systems, and we don't see everything, but majority of that, um, those are the formal digital payments. 85%, and it, and it actually it comprises of only 15% of the overall payments happening in the country. So why the payment system in South Africa works is thanks to cash. 85% of transactions are cash. They are usually small value transactions for day-to-day -day necessities, but um, it would be wrong from me to say that today South Africa is served well and everything is working well because vast majority of uh, South Africans and the transactions are actually happening only thanks to cash issued by the central bank. Um, so we have still so a long way to go. So I'm glad that you brought that up because... Um, 
Is this why rapid payments has been you know, developed? If you start from the top, I'm assuming there's a policy decision that starts at uh, government and feeds through international treasury and um, a fair amount of work gets carried out. But when we talk about rapid payments, what was the sort of underlying goal that we're trying to achieve here? No, uh, you are you are absolutely correct. So of course it's fitting the it's fitting the bill of the Vision 2025 issued by the by the central bank. Uh, the Payment Association of South Africa also had a vision how payments uh, should be done in the future. They call it Project Future. So maybe we should all get kind of help from you as a marketing person because RPP doesn't seem like the most catchy name and uh, no, Project Future. <laughs> I know, but we will no, change it's, it's, it's terrible. But listen, so uh, there are multiple things because I truly believe that financial inclusion can only come hand in hand with uh, digital digital inclusion. So the digital agenda for South Africa, um, I'm not saying that if you have a smooth and friction free payment system, your economy will start doing better. But usually when you look around the world, an economy which is doing well has a well functioning and friction free payment system. So our objective is really to build something which will be an alternative to cash, right? We don't want to compete for these 4 billion transactions where I think broadly everybody is served quite well. Uh, we could do better. We could probably, you know, uh, be cheaper and all of that stuff. But when you look at the remaining 50 billion transactions which are happening, the long lines at the queue uh, or the long queues at the ATMs, that's something we are trying to change. And uh, it requires a completely different mind shift if you are really competing with physical physical cash and you want to give people the trust uh, they have in, in currency and banknote into the digital world. And that's what we are trying to do as part of the RPP. So I, on the build up to this, and when I was looking at it, I thought to myself, uh, a thought which I hadn't had before, I was thinking, should uh, payments actually be a human right. I don't want to be too extreme here, but you think about how important um, payment is. You cannot live life. You can't do anything without the ability to pay on receive, whether you're in the informal sector or in a massive conglomerate. And then you think about the difficulty if you're in the informal sector of making payment, the cost and the time that you waste. And I sort of came to the conclusion that it's probably as important, if not more, than just general access to data in the internet. And so in a, in a perfect world, you can imagine it should be free, it should be instant, it should be simple to understand, it should be um, available for everyone to access time in, time out. And I'm going to throw in another one as well, and I say you should be able to access it in some way, shape or form, even if you don't have a bank account, or if you haven't gone through a FICA process with a proof of residence. Because if you want to go and empower people to make payments, the more blockers and barriers you put in the way, then you're not really achieving the goal of democratizing this access you know, to data. So, so is that roughly what Bank Serve are trying to work towards with your partners across the board, or is that a bit too far? Well, and uh, of course, on the side, we will also solve the world peace and uh, world hunger. Yeah, yeah. so you, you mentioned a lot of things. Uh, we as uh, a small but proud organization here in Selby, Johannesburg, South Africa, we have big ambition and we are definitely driving towards uh, bringing payments in a more comfortable, simple to use way. Because uh, exactly when you describe all these things people need today in order to pay, cash is kind of the default to go. I, I wouldn't, I, I, we can have an argument if uh, payments are more important than wi access to Wi-Fi, access to data and stuff like that. I think it probably goes hand in hand. I don't think you can have one without the other in today's digital economy, but uh, you are correct. Me, I'm a payments geek, right? I wake up in the morning and I love payments. I think about payments all day, but you guys don't. And I, I'm not upset, right? You, you only pay and it's a Kind of a painful process because you want goods you want services or you want something the payment is just the means to an end and it should be invisible it should be like wi-fi right it should be accessible everywhere okay so you're working towards that and i'm going to go back to one of the words that i used which was free all right now i don't know if a lot of people realize that payments we actually do pay for across the different channels in one way or another right there's no question about that and one of the organizations or the um, or the sets of organizations that go and make a lot of money from this are our dear friend, the banks. Now, the banks, they're your shareholders. So as you're pushing forward on trying to go and make this a much more efficient, frictionless, cheaper service, how have you got the banks on site to go and support this? Because it feels a bit of a juxtaposition where they might not be aligned to your interests because where there's friction, you can make profit. Mm -hmm. uh, true. 
true. Uh, any friction actually creates a kind of benefit for some, uh, but it may be a little bit short-sighted to be just betting on friction because as you mentioned, if somebody comes up with a solution which removes the friction, you lost your, you lost your business model. So just a few comments. We as a company, and that's why I love working here, our purpose is not to make money for our shareholders. Our purpose is actually to enable broad financial institutions to better people's lives in Canada. That's in our mission statement. That's why many people actually join the organization. That's why I joined the organization. We have uh, five shareholders. Um, so the four large banks, and uh, then there is a group of uh, smaller banks who are you know, a minority shareholder. We don't pay dividends. We don't really give that much benefit the shareholders even our board is actually completely balanced we have five independent directors and five shareholding directors and the chair is independent and the reason for that colin is uh, because we need to serve broader community of customers than just the shareholding banks even today you know our customers we have many more customers than uh, than the five uh, five shareholders and um, how we are selling it so you have two models which uh, have been applied around the world. One is that you ask the government to put, right? And they kind of issue a directive and they say, you must do this, otherwise you lose your license or otherwise you cannot do this. I came from Canada uh, and US and North America, generally, uh, we don't like the approach you Europe usually takes where things are, innovation is happening through directives. I believe more into market forces. So what we try to do, and that was you know almost four years ago when I joined in 2018, late 2018, we actually built a case, business case. And exactly as you mentioned, you know, in today's world, nothing is for free. And we explained to the banks, okay, you may be making some money here on the four billion digital payments which you process for your customers, but you are actually losing a lot of money managing cash because managing cash is extremely expensive. And if you start thinking not about, you know, how the banks compete for the small pie of 4 billion transactions, but if you increase the pie into 60 billion transactions being the addressable market, it completely changes the dynamic. Especially if you say, eventually, there may be less cash in circulation for you to cater for and less risk. We all see, you know, the cash in transit cars being blown up. Uh, people actually die because of cash. So, uh, the business case we created doesn't work for every single bank, but for industry on industry level, it uh, it started making sense. And that's why we are moving, uh, I would say, a little bit faster than some of the other countries where it was just a regulatory push from the government. All right. So the, the banks, um, for now, I believe you are relatively in support of what you're trying to do. Um, it's quite clear that Fidelity and ADT aren't. Uh, because if you're successful in moving this 85% into digital and cash in transit moves away, they must lose a fairly significant revenue stream on their sides. So anyway, it's been several years in the making. I've seen that um, you've collaborated with the banks and a, and a bunch of others. Um, was it Parser as well? You've actually flown abroad. You've gone and met people across Asia. And um, I saw there's some quite in, you know, um, constructive, detailed reports from IQ. This has all led to the program which was kicked off a few years back. And here we are in 2022, and you're about to release three important updates as part of this rapid payments program. Do you want to just explain what they are? <laughs> Sure, uh, four years in the making. And you're right, I actually forgot that what we did with some of the key stakeholders, we actually brought them to Southeast Asia. And it was interesting to talk to some of the some of the people there, what they did. And uh, you know, when you talk to the Indian stakeholders, right, with 1.4 billion people, the scope of change there is incredible. And of course, India is one of the countries where the where the government pushed very, very hard. So it was necessarily a market driven approach but it helped because we heard them you know when you can when you do something when you get into this mission mode you can make wonders and uh, you know i was new to the country and then they were telling me uh you know nelson mandela's quote uh, everything seems impossible until it's done and that's kind of where we are so listen guys i i don't i don't want to again disappoint anyone because what i'm gonna tell you that we are introducing may sound like in 21st century it should not be a problem and it should already exist right i can send an email from any place in the world to some other place in the world in a matter of seconds 
So the fact that we will introduce a better payments experience in South Africa in compared to that uh, sounds um, sounds like uh, maybe not as ambitious, but I can tell you based on where we are, it's a huge undertaking. So there are three features, as you mentioned, which we are bringing to the market. And uh, what we believe is that these features will be then used by financial institutions, banks, non-banks, and everybody else, almost like little functional blocks. And you will be able to combine them uh, with some other you know, small blocks, which we will also introduce. Um, to provide a customer experience of your own, because that's where we want the competition to happen. But the three blocks, kind of the Lego bricks, which we are which we are developing on the industry level, are first one is uh, something called uh, real time clearing or rapid clearing, and again, it doesn't seem like something uh, super revolutionary, but uh, we will ensure that the experience you have when you pay with a banknote is translated into the money movement in the digital world. So we, as the operator in the center, and we have never done it before, we will force a common user experience. So regardless if you do it with one bank or another, uh, when you decide to send a rapid payments uh, payment, and by the way, the name will be changed, um, we will ensure that within 10 seconds, the receiving bank confirms that they got money and they make it available to you on the bank account. So you can use it, you know, the 11 second to pay for something else like you would with the cash. And that's something which doesn't happen today, right? We, in many systems, we don't enforce this form of SLA that if we don't hear back from the bank within 10 seconds, we don't sometimes cancel the, the payment and it's kind of keeps pending or it's hanging. That's not the experience which will be in the real time or rapid clearing because we will enforce within seconds, the money will go through, it's irrevocable, you can use the money or the payment fails. There is no in between. So again, it doesn't seem like much, but it's a bit of a game changer that you don't have to send something in advance day in advance in some cases, and then the money kind of happens later. No, when you decide to pay, you pay, and in a few seconds, it should be on the other side. That's number one. Number two is, um, I don't know how much you love exchanging the bank account numbers and the branch branch codes and all of that stuff, right? That's kind of difficult. If I want to pay you, Colin, I need to ask you for, uh, for bank account uh, number and for your branch and bank and all of that stuff. What we are creating, we call it a proxy, but basically you will be allowed as Colin uh, to register something which people probably know about you, being it your cell phone number, being it your business name or whatever you decide to use. And uh, then you can link it to the bank account of your choice or the store of value of your choice, because in the future, as you mentioned, it will not be only bank accounts. And then when I need to pay you, how the experience is going to happen, I already have you in my cell phone because you call me way too often, Colin. And um, <laughs> I say, I want to pay this cell phone number, right? And when uh, I say initiate this payment, it comes back from the bank, which you register it with and says, hey, it's calling Colin Isles. Is it the guy you are trying to pay? I was like, yeah, I am. And I will send the payment. So we are creating this better addressability that people can send the payment without necessarily knowing too much information about you, but something that uh, that's publicly available. So that's number two. Again, mm -hmm. it's kind of a more sophisticated digital address book, but uh, we believe it will change uh, quite a bit the payments experience. And the last one is called Request to Pay. And uh, I think people haven't completely figured out all around the world how powerful that feature actually is. And the idea is that you can request a payment from someone. So, for example, you know, if you if I paid for dinner we had last night, I can kind of send you a request to pay, reminding you, Colin, you owe me it was a cheap dinner, hundred rand for um, for the beer, and uh, you just when it pops up, you just say yes or no, and in one click and with proper biometric authentication, uh, you you issue the payment. So it's kind of one use case, but it can be used in e-commerce where you just put your you know, cell phone number and it sends you a request to pay, which you just confirm on your, on, on your cell phone. It can, be, it can be done also in the physical point of sale. So those are kind of the three features. There is a lot underneath, right? Uh, there is a lot of payments jargon, like ISO 2022, rich data coming back and forth, exchanging fraud information to protect your money. 
But those are the three features which we are bringing to the market, which we believe will be used uh, quite widely to change the payments experience of today. So we've got instant interbank, which I'm not 100% sure is necessarily helping on the 85% uh, cash movement into digital. I'm 100% sure it helps the banks to reduce their uh, payment settlement, credit risk, and other risks running the process. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But I was super excited about the next two. I thought the uh, request to pay, I can imagine myself, um, particularly living here in Joburg, with the um, city of Joburg continually asking me to sign a mandate where they can steal from my account month in, month out, <laughs> and not going through that process and saying, I want to approve every transaction that you're trying to go and take from me. If I've got that right, I really like the sound of that. And I really like the Colin, sound of uh, Colin, can I ask you on this one? Because um, I spent a lot of time um, thinking about payments, right? And that's both in Europe, in Canada, and now in South Africa. Because in Europe, being Czechoslovakian, uh, we don't do debits. Exactly what you said. If there is an invoice which comes, it has a QR code, I scan it and I pay it, or I receive kind of a request to pay, ideally. We are still working on it. Check it doesn't exist. Um, and that's what I came with. Um, in, in Canada, when we did the big modernization of the Canadian payment system, we ran all these roadshows across Canada. You know, it's multiple miles, multiple time zones, it's a large country. And it's funny because you always want to watch what the millennials are doing, right? It almost feels like millennials, they know what to do. So you watch them and say, okay, he's still taking elevator. He's not taking stairs. Oh my goodness. So you, we spent a lot of time talking to Canadians about uh, the experience. And I suggested like UK, I think UK proposed something similar that we should get rid of debits, right? Um, the debits are kind of dangerous, uh, there is debit order abuse if we don't manage it well and stuff like that. Canadians, they love their debits. We said, don't touch our debits. I don't want to be late with my payment because I have forgotten. Of course, in South Africa, one of the world's firsts is called early debit orders. I know we now replaced it with debit check, but the idea there is that people try to get the money even before it appears on your, on your bank account. So I don't know, what do you think South Africans, would you, do you think they like their debits or is it just kind of the necessary, necessary evil that because people are quite exposed, um, people are trying to get the money before you deciding how you do your cash flow management? Yeah, so if we can, I mean, people, let's put that on the chat. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's my fault. I think I put the chat so only the uh, hosts and the panelists are, will, will see it, but I'll copy paste the ones that are interesting back. I mean, my, my sense on that is, it's a question of trust. If you're in Canada, a direct debit's wonderful. You know, if you're if your service provider, whether that be for your energy needs or rates and taxes or a thousand and one other things, um, your subscription to a certain service, if you trust them, that's fine. But unfortunately, I think in South Africa, there's so many examples now. It seems to be the money gets taken, and I and I hear this across the board. It can be um, people getting frustrated because they feel their data has been taken from them, you know, from the uh, cell phone provider. Um, and they haven't been able to go and get any recourse to get it back. It's so many people have said their electricity or the water bill has just been massively inflated for some sort of problem. And it's really hard to get that money back, whether you're in the right or the wrong. And so mm. certainly when, when the bill comes through and it's significantly more than you expect from whatever that service was, to be able to approve the payment and not just have it whipped away from you, um, I think is, is positive. Another one which pops up, I don't want to go too much into this, which I think most people may not even be aware of, but is incredibly frustrating and is certainly a little bit different in South Africa is SARS can just take the money. As soon as they've calculated what that tax bill is, there's no debate. You'll have signed a form at somewhere or your terms and conditions with your banking organization have been adjusted. That's money's gone. And it's a lot harder to go and get the money back and have that conversation. When uh, So I think that's just a question of trust that uh, goes with it. I don't want to go too much on that, though. Um, we'll come back and see what people have chatted. Anonymous has given a really cool question. How's the instant payments work, and will it be API-based? And how are each of the banks building? And hey, okay, now we are talking. Uh, now so listen, I have a technical background. Sorry, Colin. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean to speak over you, but um, I have a technical background, so of course I got excited. Um, one non-negotiable when we started, and by the way, that's also how we... Because you can argue we are a company which is a utility. We are not state-owned utility, but sometimes there is still a connotation that uh, the utilities cannot be run in a modern, innovative way. And maybe some of them struggle, and we definitely struggled as well. We are celebrating 50 years today. Uh, so um, 
that's uh, or not today this this month in in june it's uh, it's coming uh, so we have been around for quite some time which means we have some legacy we have some inertia which we are working with and um, one thing which is interesting to see uh, is when you work for a company which tries to be innovative, and some people told, told me, you kind of have to convince the CEO and sometimes the board that it's a good idea to try something. When you work for a network like us, I need to convince 16 or 20 CEOs of different banks that something is a good idea. And that mm -hmm. usually doesn't mean agile, right? Trying to convince 16 organizations, but 20 organizations with different objectives, that doesn't translate into speed. So we try to do something very different. And by the way, the rapid payments program, it wasn't about rapid payments. It was about rapid program initially. So the idea was that we will do the program fast, not necessarily the payments fast, because that's kind of implied. But what we did, and I feel that's kind of something the new technology allows you to do, we started prototyping. So we set up a few APIs in a sandbox, and we basically brought the technical people from different parts of the of the industry to play, right? And we created kind of mock up, uh, you know, uh, uh, mobile apps and all of that stuff. And we created excitement because when you create excitement that some of this new thing is possible, um, it just moves faster afterwards. It's almost like the three D printing completely revolutionized the manufacturing because you can try things relatively quickly. I feel in today's world you can do a lot. So. As part of the pilot, um, there were a few non-negotiables we learned, right? One, APIs, microservices all the way. And even when we were looking for some technology partners, people kind of tell you, yeah, this is microservices. Well, no, I don't want one macro service, which you call a microservice. No, we want modular systems. We want APIs completely. Uh, we want cloud ready or cloud, cloud native. No, that was another requirement. So yes, API, microservices, the platform will be hosted in the cloud. And that wasn't an easy undertaking because we had to convince the regulator that the national mm. payment system can live in the cloud. We are in the testing phase, as I mentioned, in the market acceptance, but it's going to be in the cloud. So we are really using most of the new modern technology which is available. So you don't have to rebuild, you know, the redundancy. Like you don't have to think and spend time how I'm going to have, you know, cold and hot copy no, you are completely horizontally scalable in the cloud and you can focus on the value you are actually bringing to your customers, not the not the underly, underlying infrastructure. That was a big, big learning for us. We'll, we'll definitely take advantage of it also with our, our other product. So what's the vision looking forward, though? Because this program started four or five years ago. These building blocks of the first releases are, uh, let's call it fun. They open up some nice opportunities. But actually, the infrastructure you've created, the API-enabled microservices, cloud-based is really what should be exciting to open up opportunities for third parties to come in and offer uh, products and services and solve problems on this, this marketplace in a standardized way. What are you hoping happens over the next two or three years, either with projects you're running or the opportunities that it opens for third parties? Yeah. Um, so listen, I think one thing we never got right as the payments experts is that we don't make things easy for you to use or consume or for the end users for that matter, right? Even this idea that we sell different products based on, we even call it a rail, which it runs on, right? It's a card payment. It's an EFT payment, it's a epic check payment. Like nobody thinks that way. Nobody wants to think that way, right? And uh, sometimes I use the example of a post office or postal service. And I know in South Africa, it's a little bit different. But in most parts of the world, even post office, when you go and want to send a parcel, they don't ask you, should I put it on a diesel truck or should I send a pigeon with it? No, they ask you, does it have to be there quickly? You know, is it valuable and you need to insure it and make sure that you always know where it is? Um, and that's the language I think we will need to start talking about as payments people, right? You don't care if something is a tax payment or if something should be a car payment. What matters to you is how quickly does, do you need it on the other side? Is it real time uh, or should it be, you know, today and you can wait for a few hours? And of course, it probably makes different commercial models which people will build on. And that means, and I, we have a whole strategy about it, which we call Bank Surf Africa 2.0. You could argue that 
with 50 years of history, maybe we should be at Bank Surf Africa 5.0, but we are moving to 2.0. And the idea is exactly what you described. We will have a brand new technical platform, and now we have multiple products. We will not just migrate there, but we will look at them and we will kind of take the pieces, take advantage of the, of the new platform. I don't want to do just a lift and shift and move something to the cloud for the sake of moving it to the cloud. No, we will kind of expand the functionality of this platform to start using batch, potentially even with the proxy, right? Why do you kind of, cannot you use proxy also for your EFT payments? Debit check, right? Debit check, uh, you talked about the trust. Debit check is trying to fix the, the debit order issues. And all of these things we will be doing over the next uh, three to five maybe seven years, you know, these things don't happen overnight. EFT has been around for decades. So it's gonna be a bit of a journey, but the idea is to uh, reduce the cost, increase efficiency and increase uh, security. And one last thing, Colin, I just want to mention, you know, what it means kind of for the broader ecosystem. We, we work in a, re a heavily regulated environment, right? Um, who can hold deposits uh, has to be a bank. That's uh, where we stand currently in South Africa. And to be honest, and you saw it, somebody asked around India, you saw it also in other parts of the world that uh, being a bank or holding deposit, it's a difficult job because regardless, you know, who you are, you should be regulated quite, uh, quite strictly because people don't want to lose their, their money. So what we, what we are about with around this new platform, we want to make sure that this platform where the money moves is actually very, very secure. Right. And whoever is the regulated institution being in a bank or non-bank in the future, where the money kind of moves or the money is held and then they move to the other store of value, that will be very, very heavily guarded. But now there will be some non-financial messages, APIs, right? We mentioned the request to pay, the proxy, and all of that stuff. It can be probably initiated also by not only banks right, in the future. So what no. I see us doing is this platform which orchestrates in a very secure risk managed way how these transactions and these interactions actually happen. So we want to be an orchestration industry platform where we ensure that the money moves eventually, but you don't have to worry about, right? You kind of request somebody to pay or you do, you do these uh, more business-like uh, requests. All right, so here's a, here's a, a great question. I think very important from uh, Andre Hugo from uh, Spot Money here. Um, do the fintechs or anyone to, for that matter, do they have to work through the sponsor banks to access these APIs or are they gonna be able to work with you directly? And I think that's such an important question because you know, is it allowing people to, to, it's a proper free open marketplace, you know, the same way I guess your open banking is over in Europe. Um, or are we still constrained? You know, I picked up on this fact that you said we still have to go through banks to keep deposits. That's the, that's the current regulation. So we uh, we will offer pretty much any flexibility because anybody who is allowed to call an API will be able to call an API. I would just argue even today, Colin, not all our APIs are only open to banks. I mentioned we are called BankServe, but we serve a broader community. We have the system operators. We have TPPs. There is actually a designation called the Designated Clearing System Participant. So even a non-bank can actually go to a licensing process, not too cumbersome, and get a license to deal with us directly without, without a sponsoring bank. So there are multiple kind of avenues. The idea is, and that was clear indication by the regulator, they want to make it uh, more open. But what needs to happen, Colin, before that, uh, that is introduced is something we call activity-based uh, licensing or regulation. So they cannot license you and regulate you based on who you are, but more what you do. Because when you look at payments, we have, you mentioned, a settlement, a clearing. Before that, it's payment initiation. You can have proxy, request to pay. There is a different risk involved with every single step in this payments value chain, right? So when it comes to the clearing and settlement, probably the regulatory burden should be the highest. But for some of the others, uh, and the regulator already indicated, there will be some other licensing people will be able to get, and they will be able to play in that activity of the payment. So we build it very flexibly, but um, the regulator will have to make some of these changes to um, to uh, change the current environment. But even today, it's not just the banks. There are many, many options how you can uh, how you can talk to us directly. You say the regulators are going to have to make changes. Have you have you found them quite willing um, 
to go and listen to different market segments and being actually able to go and in a and <laughs> okay it's a regulator it's not going to be super quick i'm not expecting months but do you find them quite open and engaging with different stakeholders to go and look at um putting new regulations in to go and make it a freer more open system for people Listen, I'm not going to be bad mouthing uh, Sard here, but I also I, I'm generally a fair person. I, I am really happy with how the South African Reserve Bank and the Payment Association of South Africa, but mainly the South African Reserve Bank, is uh, pushing this program. I don't like when this when the central banks are too pushy that they kind of prescribe what needs to happen. I don't also like the model uh, the North American banks sometimes take, central banks sometimes take. Let the market figure it out. The SARP was clear what they want to see, and they were also clear that if it doesn't happen quickly, uh, they will step in. They are willing to have a dialogue. Um, it's not easy, Colin, you know, to change law and regulation, right? There are a lot of kind of steps you have to go through. So maybe it's going a little bit slower than the regulators themselves would have liked. But uh, I feel that the balance between, you know, listening to the industry and pushing uh, is pretty good, actually, here in, uh, in South Africa. So you said that, and I've said it already, but I said again, you said, <clears throat> you know, that a key requirement is that you have to have an account, a deposit with a bank, and then you sort of, you can enter the payment mechanism one way or another. There is, of course, one way to solve that problem, and that's via blockchain. Right? This idea that the bank holds my deposit, why on earth do we need that? I can sit here um, and use any number of platforms under this kind of, you know, this veil of DeFi, as they call it, and sit there and say, using this uh, smart contract on Ethereum, this is my account, which I own on this distributed network where everyone is playing very nicely with each other without a central authority. And if I want to pay Jan, I'm gonna pay you. Mm -hmm. And I can go and organize this and orchestrate it in a way where that payment can be me clicking a button to make the payment to you, or it can be something that's um, quite intricate through the smart contract. So certain circumstances and events have occurred, which in turn will initiate the payment. So for example, escrow is a nice obvious one. If the house suddenly completes and the lawyer clicks the button to say that the uh, the deeds office has been updated and there's no problems, bang, let's go and release that money from this particular account, which we've created. We can do that essentially for free. And obviously we're seeing lots of organizations um, trying to co and create this infrastructure. There's thousands of them. You started this program before we really saw this kind of idea of decentralization. There was Bitcoin and there were people, I think, at a, a sort of a niche level starting to talk about these things, but it's exploded over the last two or three years. What is this going to change how your program operates? Is there an opportunity for you to bring these aspects into what you're doing? Basically, how are you going to deal with this? Because it feels like mm -hmm. you know there's a massive opportunity here or maybe it's just hype. Well, and if I knew the answer, I would... Um... I would probably uh, have a silver bullet for many, many things. Um, listen, I have been playing with blockchain for a long time. Actually, one of the first uh, central bank uh, blockchain projects called Jasper in Canada, that was kind of our idea. We just sat down around the, around the lunch table and we came up with something. It backfired badly, and that's probably for another, for another story for us. But um, the problem I have, I always kind of convince myself of something. And uh, then, you know, it takes a while until I convince myself of something else, right? Because we all learn as the, as the situation evolves. So a few things on, uh, on the topic of blockchain. So first of all, I think uh, cash or currency will evolve. So there is a big discussion about the central bank digital currency. And by the way, it doesn't have to be blockchain. It doesn't necessarily have to be a digital, uh, sorry, distributed ledger technology of sorts. But I believe like there was a switch from you know, currency where these heavy coins, uh, ha you know, precious metal coins, which was quite difficult to carry around. So we we swapped for banknotes, right? Paper, or it was banked at least kind of backed with uh, gold. Now uh, it's just uh, based on the trust you have in the state and the central bank. I feel that next generation of currency will be some form of a digital currency. And I'm a recovering central banker, so it has a lot of implications in terms of liability and how this gets distributed into the retail market and all of that stuff. I don't know. Uh, that's that's potential. The blockchain overall, as you mentioned, you know, there are very good use cases when it comes to the delivery versus payment, right? You are expecting something and you have to pay for it and kind of who does it first? And that's where you have the escrows and stuff like that. 
There are probably other methods where you can do it, but it seems quite uh, quite efficient. Um, the only problem with kind of a blockchain technology, if you are dogmatic that it should be a, you know permissionless blockchain where it's kind of self-regulated and nobody has a say, there is no central entity which can control the blockchain. The problem is Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin hasn't taken up because there is no one eight hundred Bitcoin you can call if something goes wrong. Right? That, that, that doesn't exist. So then you have a kind of tendency to say, okay, let's create a permission blockchain like your Ethereum or Hyperledger or whatever these technologies are, and then you kind of give a little bit more power to someone to kind of resolve conflicts or do something a little bit more than the others. Then I debate. Well, why don't you ask this person you trust to do a little bit more? Why don't you actually give them the rights to trigger the payments or manage their own own database? So we'll see. What we are doing in terms of RPP to answer your question, we are playing with some of these things because, for example, the proxy, you know, where the address book is kind of hosted and how it's distributed, we build it on a distributed ledger technology. And it's more future proofing than anything else, because probably at the beginning where we go live, we will host two nodes and they will be both hosted by us, right? But it's more future proofing than in the future when we can kind of distribute some of these uh, uh, databases or ledgers to other participants. It creates more efficiency. It creates kind of a um, uh, different way of working. So that's one thing we've done. The second thing, and that's more my crystal ball, I started the discussion today with this idea that we needed to connect the closed loop or interconnect the closed loop environments of the different banks, right? So you don't have to have multiple point of sale terminals when, when somebody comes and wants to pay. I feel even if Bitcoin or any other CBDC or stablecoin actually picks up, it will be very hard to make one closed loop which would serve everyone. Right, uh, like the example with the banks, it's unlikely that there would ever be one bank which uh, everybody who, where everyone has an account and they do everything there. Where it becomes complicated is when you need to kind of go out of this, you know, one island, being it some form of a blockchain or CBDC, to another, and that's where I see the role for us uh, because that's what we do. Right, we create kind of this interconnectedness of different islands when people need to move value from one to another. What the value is, if it's commercial bank money, if it's loyalty points, if it's God knows what, people are willing to keep their wealth in. I think we, as clearing houses, we will have to find a way how to do clearing and settlement across these environments uh, ourselves. And it's not trivial. I sat on the W3C, uh, which is the body governing internet. They have been trying to solve for the interledger, so basically interconnectivity between blockchains for quite some time. There are a lot of smart people. They haven't still quite cracked it yet, um, but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So I feel we will not be disintermediated immediately, Colin. Uh, okay. But I may be completely wrong. Well, let's see. Let's see how that develops. Okay, as always happens, some great questions are coming in just when we're getting to the close. We'll do what we can. Um, I think for the uh, specifics on the TPP DCSP requiring a sponsoring bank, um, following on from um, Andre's question, and I think some more questions from Andre, we'll try to pick those up um, separately, perhaps. So if anyone wants the answers to those, email me. I guess they're the sort of things that potentially should be published on the website or in a blog. There may be some demand um, to actually tell that. So we won't answer that one now. Um, from... What have we got here? This one I quite liked um, from Nande. I don't know if you can answer this one quickly, but give it a go. It doesn't matter what you're doing in your space. If we don't sort out FICA, uh, you're hardly going to democratize access um, to making payments. What's the, is, is there a possibility to go and, I mean, why, can we get the regulators to say, look, for people that don't hold accounts with more than, I don't know, 1500 Rand, right. there should be no FICA, you should be exempt. It should just be. Yeah. And uh, there are actually some models, again, for FICA light. Uh, you know that some banks uh, introduce that you can send money to your gardener, uh, gardener's cell phone number, and uh, to certain limit, uh, the bank doesn't know anything 
about the person you actually send the money to. They but that's that's so that they can do a cash withdrawal. I'm saying, can't we just make it that they can actually have a proper digital store? But uh, in, in some instances, people can actually use it also to make payment, that they don't have to withdraw the money only. They can make payments. It's still in closed loops. So, of course, the interoperability is something which we need to resolve, uh, ideally as part of the RPP. I'm just trying to say that the regulator has started thinking about the risk-based approach, right? It's very different if somebody is holding uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of rand versus somebody is using a transactional uh, transactional account for something. So it has not been completely resolved, like foreign exchange controls. That's another pain point, uh, which I think Africa overall will have to resolve somehow. But I hear you. There is a little bit of a plug. We started the digital identity project where some of these FICA, RICA requirements, and it's a broad collaboration, not only by banks, community with telcos and everybody else because i believe that the authorization and authentication and digital identity broadly can be actually done not about building a new one but again interconnecting the home office and the home affairs database with somebody who can register foreigners with somebody else who knows you know your credentials when it comes to education so we have another major project next to rtp and that's linked to digital identity because we like challenges um, but some of these answers uh, we are trying to find um, through the work there. Okay, a one word answer for my last question, then I'll hand over to Marius. Um, India, we know, is uh, really doing some amazing things with payments and, you know, the sort of uh, identity management on a, a scale which is beggars belief. Which African country is leading the pack, in your opinion, when it comes to, um, you know, designing a proper 21st century payment system? One word answer. It's hard. Uh, you will probably not get one word answers. Uh, you know, everybody talks about Kenya and PESA and all of that stuff. Uh, it, it's a great tool, but for very specific use case. I like what Ghana is pushing for. I think Ghana with some of their tools and stuff like that is also good. But everybody's addressing their own uh, own thing. So I think it's going to be South Africa who will set the tone. Thanks, Jan. Marius. You're on mute, as it always happens. <laughs> Just for once, it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jan, for joining us. Uh, we really enjoyed your enthusiasm around payments. Um, you know, it's when I was at university, um, you know, you had a few professors that got excited about mathematics. And, and, and then you then you would know that they, they are real, you know, um, lovers of what they do. So thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, around our call, and I think that uh, you know the specifically real time clearing and making it easier for people to pay is going to make a massive difference. I think um, it is probably one of the reasons why we have debit orders because it does reduce some friction that you don't have to do it because it's an effort to do it every month and you forget about it. And I think if it's, it's if it's made easier, then it's going to be you know worth our while. Um, maybe just if you can, from my just one question, I mean, there's this whole talk uh, in the industry around the cross-border payments and the cost of it. Now, from my perspective, I see like loads and loads of fintechs um, trying to solve that issue. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if it's going to get crowded. And, and you know, if you if you maybe just have a short opinion on, on cross-border payments and where that's We, we launch a... A regulatory recognized scheme across SADEC. So that's another thing we have. It's called TCIB. Yes, mm -hmm. terrible marketing, but transactions cleared on immediate basis. Um, it's live. We are onboarding more and we have now four countries and I think 10 participants. We are aiming to have 40 very, very soon. So I hope that's going to be a game changer. Just one thing, Mar Marius, is um, people make money on friction. So don't underestimate some of the existing commercial relationships. And while the noble purpose is clear, we want to make it cheaper for everyone. It will require some of the commercial models to be kind of turned upside down because people will have to find a new way how to make money. Mm. Colin, once again, thank you uh, very much for hosting. <clears throat> we look forward to our next one. Maybe um, just a bit of an advert on what's next for us, Colin. I, I think for... There's an exciting one for all um, our ladies on the call. Yeah, so we're working on that one on, on planning. I'll keep that a secret, but uh, all the ladies on the call uh, do message me. We've got some uh, cracking panelists 
that we're lining up to. And I think I'm, I'm going to do my best to host this. I might be putting my foot in it every now and then. But in broad terms, I want to get some of the successful uh, ladies that are recognizable names. You will recognize them to talk about their stories, about how they've managed to succeed with all the odds that have been against them and how things have changed over the last decade or two in their advice for other women that want to succeed in the business world. So I'm looking forward uh, to that one. That's going to be somewhere around uh, Women's Day, um, which is August, isn't it? I think. Um, yeah, and you put me on the spot. I've forgotten what the next one is. So I'll email everyone about that. <laughs> yeah. no, that's fine. Thank you, Colin. And thank you to everyone that joined. Uh, if, if there are more questions, please post them to us. And uh, I'm sure that Jan would gladly answer as well if there's something for him. Thank you, Jan. Thanks, everyone. Until next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Jan. And thanks, Marius. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.